We got nukes that could take out all that shit, though. Years and years of work down the drain. Hell yeah, brother. That's right. Let's go nuke them. Let's go Duke nuke them mode. YOLO. I'm saying it. So let's watch First Thought. What happens if Israel goes to war with Iran? Israel has become the second country in history to use nuclear weapons in war, and the first to do so as an initial preemptive strike. The target? Iran. Most of Tehran, its greater metro area, and even its suburbs have been vaporized or reduced to smoldering rubble. Obviously they're saying this is what would happen if Israel used nukes uh, as they... Müslüman değilim ama Batı'nın İslam düşmanlığı üçüncü dünya savaşı başlayacak, evet. Millions are dead. Millions more are being exposed to lethal doses of radiation. And still more are suffering life-threatening burns. Israel's only remaining ally, the United States, continues to stand by Israel's preemptive nuclear strike. The U.S. has warned Iran that any retaliation will be met with, in the president's words, overwhelming response, and that the U.S. will, quote, turn the country into glass. We may be looking at nuclear winter as Israel continues to lash out. Okay, obviously this isn't happening right now, at time of recording. But this scenario isn't as far-fetched as you might think. A 2013 study set out to understand the medical consequences of a nuclear exchange between Iran and Israel in the near future with a focus on the distribution of casualties in urban environments. Academics have been taking this scenario seriously for over a decade. Oh shit, new IDF tweet. Approximately 40 launches were identified crossing the Lebanese territory, some of which were intercepted. The IDF aerial defense array successfully intercepted two Hezbollah explosive UAVs that crossed from Lebanon into Israeli territory earlier this evening. I mean, this is earlier in the day. But uh, I don't know if, uh, I mean, that's from Hezbollah. That's different. It's not direct from Iran. Decade. And as the that's genocide regular. in Gaza continues, it's now abundantly clear that Israel is the nation most likely to initiate a full-scale nuclear or conventional war in the region. Let's explore the consequences <clears throat> of a war between Israel, Iran, and their respective allies. Before we answer that, we'd like to take a quick moment to thank this episode's sponsor, Aura. As you all know, we make political content here and on our other channels. Unfortunately, that means some people don't like us very much. These days, a quick Google search is all it takes to find someone's personal information. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all readily available for those who want to find it. That's why I've been using Aura to help keep my private details private. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. This not only cuts down on the amount of spam I get, but also helps keep all my accounts safe from bad actors. And Aura does so much more. It's a VPN, a password manager, an antivirus. It even offers identity theft insurance and parental controls. And the best part is, it's all in one place and very reasonably priced. So if you're like me and you value your privacy and staying safe online, visit Aura.com slash first thought and get your first two weeks absolutely free, no strings attached. Try it out and I promise you'll appreciate the peace <coughs> of mind. Support the show and protect your valuable data by signing up today at the link below. Ethical reacts, bro. Ethical reacts imply we watch the ads and you don't have to watch the ads at the top of the hour when there are three minute ad breaks that happen at the top of the hour. Okay. That's right. Because at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break uh, right after this ad break. Freaking got them. And if you no longer want to have uh, the moment to self reflect, to read, to watch ads for three minutes, and you want an uninterrupted broadcast experience, Fluck, thank you for the 10 community gifted subs. You can maybe receive an ad, a gifted ad, uh, break Defender in the form of a subscription from the likes of Flucky and many others. Or if you're not lucky enough, you can make your own luck by subscribing for $5 or for free. Here is the three, the three minute ad break now. It's not just act. You said you'd still stream if nukes were flying. Are you still up for that with us? Yes. Yes. I will spend most likely my very last moments, unless my, my internet is shut down by my stupid ass ISB. If nuclear Holocaust was happening, I'd probably spend the last moments here doing this. And many of you would be watching. Can we do unban all? Yeah academics evaluating the potential consequences of a war between Iran and Israel. 
The United States Department of Defense conducts virtual and live war games to plan for any number of scenarios. And a war with Iran was simulated in 2002 in an exercise dubbed the Millennium Challenge. The results were interesting to say the least. The Pentagon asked retired Marine Corps General Paul Van Riper to command the Iranian or Red Forces due to his reputation for unorthodox thinking. Faced with the imminent preemptive US attack, Van Riper decided to go on the offensive as soon as US forces, including two aircraft carriers, six amphibious ships, and that's true. Just ban, maybe just ban Megaphonics during the nuclear holocaust, no more Elon Pose. Megaphonics would spend his last moments on Earth still sending me what Elon Musk had to say about the nuclear holocaust. He'd be like, look at this idiot. He doesn't think it's going to happen. Elon just tweeted that the nuclear holocaust is definitely not happening and it's fake news. Look at this dumbass. We're all about to die. That's literally what he would do. <laughs> Damn, no recent messages. Your YouTube video bot message is showing an error message? Yeah, I don't know why. And their combined escorts bore down on him. Van Riper actually wanted to win the exercise, which is an accurate portrayal of Iranian leaders, and therefore refused to let the American preemptive strike succeed. Van Riper managed to sink the entire fleet, including the Marine landing force. The exercise was effectively over as soon as it began. Following this hum- Wait, why is one of the most popular Twitch streamers a terrorist supporter? Bro, Techno Tapas, you just got banned. And I'm going to unban you real quick because I need you to understand something. I have not defended the terrorist state of Israel. I have not defended the terrorist state of the United States of America. Thank you for also saying that I'm one of the most popular Twitch streamers because that is still true. Despite what my haters say. Techno Tapas is the most Israeli username I've ever heard. Yeah, I know. That's pretty funny. But <clears throat> spiritually, thank you for letting me have an opinion. Of course, you are... You are welcome to have the wrong opinion. <sighs> Bro, you can't glaze and roast? What do you mean? You defended the right to a fair trial yesterday, you liar. So I, I hope you get nothing Israeli about it. <laughs> Brother, you don't understand <laughs> why it sounds so Israeli. You don't understand Israeli culture if you think that this is... Techno Tapas is not a very... <laughs> I feel like there's a restaurant in Israel called Techno Tapas already. <laughs> it is pretty funny, though, that like... Thank you for letting me have an opinion. Bro, you did deserve the ban for the record. I'm just having fun with it because that's an insane statement. Once again, like I said, insane statement because I do not defend the terrorist state of Israel, nor do I defend the terrorist state of the United States of America. But yes, that is a worthy ban usually. The brain rot is real in here, lol. I'm also having fun. Okay. You are radicalized. Hassan, honestly, you're radicalized, but it's fine. If I am radicalized because I believe in healthcare for all Americans, if I believe in free college education for all Americans, if I believe that America should stop killing people relentlessly globally, then yes, I am a radical. If you consider anti-genocide to be a radical statement, then yes, I am a radical person. It is no measure of <laughs> it is no measure of sanity to be well adjusted to an insane society okay to a deeply unhealthy and unwell society anyway we are in the age of radicalism people do it to themselves log in the paris basement the demise of the america kkk on empire is causing a lot of freaks to call from under the trash they live in huh no i think that person is just like spitballing in the chat because he thinks he can quote unquote trigger me Humiliating defeat, the U.S. brass instructed Van Riper that he- Bro, this is the most classic Millennium Challenge memes. Like, what do you mean, uh, go back on it? You, I've talked about it a million times over. If you are even remotely interested in, like, America versus Iran, you probably heard this a million times over. Again, yes, Millennium Challenge, they owned, the, the Iranian forces owned the American Navy so hard that they had to literally put the Iranian forces on handicaps and then run it again, run the simulation again. They could not shoot down the aircraft flying cover missions for their ground forces, that their offensive weapons weren't allowed to be hidden, and that they couldn't use chemical warfare yeah, against see. the blue team's paratroopers. Van Riper was so disgusted with how controllers were running the exercise, tying the hands of his red team to ensure blue won, that he sat the rest of it out. With these remarkable handicaps in place, the US succeeded in destroying Iran's military capabilities. The exercise demonstrated that the U.S. was inflexible and wasn't able to think quickly in response to the offensive response to the preemptive attack, and that this would not serve the U.S. well in an actual conflict. 
This simulation, as well as the resistance strike on Israel on October 7th, shows that no matter how much sophisticated technology your military utilizes, innovative warfare combined with adaptability can be just as lethal. Since even the arrogant US recognizes that Iran is a formidable force, let's examine their military industry from its early days till today as it continues to thrive despite heavy sanctions. Iran's defense apparatus began with the establishment of Iran Electronics Industries, or IEI, in 1973. In the decades since, IEI, focused on developing the country's military capabilities, has created many high-quality, homegrown weapons. Examples include the Akgar 7.62mm Gatling gun, <laughs> capable of firing 4 to 6,000 rounds per minute, as well as the Arman anti- I love the second thought boys doing, uh, I mean, I love JT doing like OSINT Andy shit, but for Iran. ...ballistic missile system, which can simultaneously engage six targets from up to 180 kilometers away. There's also the Fatah, a hypersonic ballistic missile with a range of 1,400 kilometers and a top speed of Mach 15, a staggering 5.1 kilometers per second. Since speeds that high are difficult to comprehend, it would be like flying from the Pentagon to the White House in one second, or crossing the Strait of Dover, 32 kilometers or 20 miles wide, in just six seconds. As if this isn't impressive enough, remember, all of this is being accomplished under a severe sanctions regime. However, these are the accomplishments of just one company. Iran possesses the largest inventory of missiles in West Asia, with a significant number being ballistic missiles specifically. Clearly, this hasn't been accomplished through the efforts of a single company. As a whole, Iran's defense ministry is focused on developing and stockpiling missile systems, naval platforms, assorted weapons, and air defenses while revitalizing its aging air and ground capabilities. It's geared towards supporting Iran's overall military strategy, which is centered around deterrence and retaliatory capabilities, utilizing unconventional warfare operations and a network of militant partners and proxies. But how is it pulling all this off under the suffocating sanctions regime? The answer can be summed up in two words, reverse engineering. Having been forced to transition away from importing weapons and technology, Iran has become arguably the most successful country at reverse engineering and developing its military equipment based on examples of enemy, mostly US, weapons in the field. Additionally, collaboration between Iran and Russia has seen a transfer of Western weapon systems for research and development, enabling Iran to drastically enhance its military capabilities. For example, reports indicate that Iran's successful Sadid 365 anti-tank guided missile was allegedly reverse engineered from American defense systems. The Ra'ad 2 self-propelled howitzer exemplifies Iran's dedication to maintaining legacy weapon systems through the same reverse engineering while combining various bits of foreign hardware. And of course we can't forget to mention Iranian drones, which have been in the news quite a bit due to their use by Russia in Ukraine and resistance groups in and around Palestine. Iranian drones have earned their place because of their versatility, low price of manufacture, <clears throat> and effectiveness. They can carry out an assortment of missions, including surveillance, reconnaissance, and attacks. This makes them an extremely valuable asset for Iran, since they don't have a traditional air force with fighters and bombers. Additionally, the country has emphasized its goal to improve the accuracy, lethal- It's kind of f***ed up. They have no respect for copyright. No respect whatsoever. For copyright. You see you see this? ...ality and over-the-horizon capabilities of its drones. But Iran hasn't just been building weapons and drones. They've also built state-of-the-art bases from which they can conduct their operations. Recently, Iran unveiled one such structure to the world, the Parchin Underground Facility. Located approximately 20 kilometers southeast of downtown Tehran, the Parchin facility reflects Iran's efforts to significantly enhance its homegrown military capabilities. While the work that goes on in the facility is not publicly available information, we know it's connected to the- Yeah, no, it's it's funny you say Toyota missiles because Marat calls uh, American drones uh, the Bentleys of drones, and he calls the Bayraktar the Toyota. Very reliable and very affordable. Bayraktars are like the Toyotas of uh, UAVs. A larger Parchin military complex. It's believed that the complex includes a large network of tunnels which might allow for additional military modalities not before moved underground, such as supply chains, which are otherwise vulnerable to attacks. We got nukes that could take out all that shit though, years and years of work down the drain. Hell yeah, brother. That's right. Let's go nuke them. Let's go duke nuke em mode. Fuck it. YOLO. The Parchin military complex is most notable for being the hub of Iran's nuclear science and defense technologies. While Iran does not possess- 
To be honest, I think they're a paper tiger, and it's all just posturing, just like Saddam used to in the past. We were pretty panicked at his chemical weapons here, and it turned out they literally had nothing. <clears throat> Do you see the Iranian protest Andes who support Israel being mad at Israelis for posting about... Wait, what? I don't even understand that. Um, I We'll see. As far as the paper tiger thing goes, we'll see. I don't think that they are that much of a paper tiger, considering that, like... That's nuclear. Their defense of Hezbollah, like, their support for Hezbollah has led to strategic w's for lebanon in general you know what i mean what are you doing king how are you i'm going to come here me keep me accuse atmosphere Clear weapons. Government officials in Israel and the United States have repeatedly expressed grave concern about the Iranian nuclear program, despite the latter pulling out of the long-sought Iran nuclear deal signed during the Obama regime. Iranian weapons have been and continue to be used in modern warfare in various conflicts and by various actors. They've obviously been utilized by Iran's own military forces, but more importantly by Iranian-backed groups in conflicts across West Asia, most notably by Lebanon's Hezbollah and Yemen's Ansar Allah. However, the scope yeah. of their use in modern warfare. That's why it's important to understand, like, w when we say paper tiger, like, even through proxies, even through proxies, uh, Iran has been able to, to definitely uh, launch a decent amount of counters to, uh, to Israeli action in the region. Warfare can be seen in Syria, where Iranian drones, missiles, and small arms have been used extensively in the Syrian civil war to support Assad and other pro-government forces. Iran has provided military aid to the Syrian government and deployed its forces, including the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, in the conflict. It can also be seen in Yemen, where they've supplied Ansar Allah with drones and ballistic missiles. These weapons have been used in attacks against Saudi Arabia, and, more recently, in attacks on any ship attempting to do business with the Israeli colonial project. In Iraq, militias have been equipped with Iranian air defense systems and small arms, and have used them in the fight against ISIS and in other internal conflicts. And last but not least, in Lebanon, several varieties of rockets with differing ranges and capabilities have been used by Hezbollah against Israel and other regional adversaries. One variant, the Haseb rocket, has a range of 8 to 10 kilometers and an 8 kg high explosive warhead, and is modeled on the Chinese Type 63 multiple rocket launcher. With such a short range, these are best used against ground forces. The Ra'ad, or Thunder rockets, are wire-guided anti-tank missiles based on the Soviet 9M-14M Malyutka and have a range of 350 kilometers, roughly the distance between Washington, D.C. and New York City. The Fajr, or Dawn rockets, actually comprise their own family, with the three major types being a long-range missile with a range of 180 kilometers, a 240mm artillery with a range of 43 kilometers, and a 333mm multiple rocket launcher system primarily used to support ground troops, strategic strikes, and for their psychological impact given the volume and intensity of the bombardment they can unleash. Lastly, the Zelzal, or Earthquake, rockets are the longest range of their non-hypersonic missiles, with a range of 200 kilometers, or roughly the distance between LA and San Diego. It comes in two variants, the 2 and 3. The Zelzal 3 is a guided missile, and must be launched using a specialized transporter erector, and are used as general artillery shells. The Zelzal II, on the other hand, is an unguided, truck-launched rocket primarily used against armored vehicles, including the Israeli Merkava main battle tank, and buildings occupied by infantry units. The rocket delivers a massive 600 kg payload. Iran's arsenal of homegrown weaponry is formidable. With all this firepower, it's not hard to see why the US lost so badly in their simulation. Since any war waged against Israel is also a war against the United States, and since the US is still the sole world superpower, we should unpack what the cost of such a war would be to the US, and by extension, the world. In order to keep this in line with most projections, we're going to assume conventional, not nuclear warfare, as do all of our sources. It goes without saying that any nuclear exchange would cause immeasurable damage and suffering for decades, possibly centuries. So let's start with the raw dollar amount, if only to show how futile it is to even attempt to nail down actual figures. A full-scale U.S. invasion of Iran pay. has been estimated to cost $1.7 trillion, according to a report by the Federation of American Scientists. This includes expenses related to troop deployments, equipment, logistics, and other military expenditures. Note that this is just for the invasion of the country. It says nothing about any long-term presence, which is nearly impossible to quantify given the number of unknowns. 
Fully estimating the cost of a US war with Iran not only includes the immediate expenses of military operations, but also the long-term costs associated with post-conflict reconstruction in both nations, extreme damage to the US economy, and the untold loss of life. The monetary cost would easily run into the many trillions of dollars, straining the US economy and hyper-focusing US spending on the military even more than it already does possibly to the point of completely giving up its responsibility to other vital areas, such as healthcare, education, and infrastructure. Unfortunately for the rest of the world, a lasting conflict with Iran would have wide-ranging implications for the global economy. It would lead to broad economic and financial shocks that would significantly worsen with time and evolving conditions. The resulting collapse of Iran's economy would see a reduction of the global GDP of as much as 0.3 percentage points, which doesn't sound like much, but would be a tremendous shock. A prolonged conflict would create unprecedented uncertainty in global financial markets, leading to increased volatility in stock prices, exchange rates, and commodity markets. This uncertainty would shake investor and consumer confidence to the core. This is why I said time and time again, this is why I keep saying time and time again, and I will continue repeating this throughout this weekend most likely, that there is a limit to the chaos uh, uh, from the perspective of capital owners all the way until the tipping point, all the way until the tipping point, capital owners will make money. Okay. But beyond that tipping point lies too much chaos and too much volatility where the systems collapse and no, there is no more money to be made. Affecting global economic growth and leading to a slowdown in business expansion and hiring. The world economy is highly reliant on key trade routes, particularly in the Strait of Hormuz, a strategically important passage that connects the Persian Gulf to the Gulf of Oman, through which approximately one-fifth of the world's oil passes. Such disruptions would lead to supply chain failures, ballooning shipping costs, and if that wasn't enough, a US-Iran conflict could trigger an escalation of proxy warfare in countries like Syria and Yemen. It could also lead to the creation of new proxy conflicts, as well as prompt Iranian missile strikes and other attacks on US allies in the region. The economic impact of a conflict with Iran would extend beyond direct financial costs. It would lead to the death. My own university has disinvited a Jewish American philosopher, Nancy Frazier, of taking up a professorship because she spoke out against the killings in Gaza. Absolutely shameful. Dude, I think people don't understand. The Western world doesn't give a f about Jews, okay? They care about Israel as a strategic entity. Like, that's why the broadest coalition of pro-Israel sentiment comes from the most rabid anti-Semites in this country, okay? Dudes who unironically think Jews have horns and tails and shit. The white evangelicals in these goddamn mega churches in the South. The broadest coalition of pro-Israel sentiment is not amongst the American Jews. It is evangelical Protestant Christians for theological reasons, okay? Those motherfuckers don't like Jewish people. They're like, yeah, like the Balfour Declaration. They're like, yeah, let God sort them out over there in the desert. I don't want to be around Jews. They have horns. Send them down to the desert. That's their take. That's it. That is precisely why, do Israelis know this and do they care? No, they don't, I don't think they give a shit. I think many people don't know this, okay? There's a multitude of different reasons, okay? Most conservatives don't like Jews, they just hate Muslims more, there's that, okay? Obviously, they hate Muslims more than they hate Jewish people, so there's that. That's a big role as well. Some see it as a bulwark, like, uh, some see Israel as like the, the, the only power to like, combat the Islamic hordes. Um, and many also have a Armageddon theological justification for Israel's existence. They believe that once the chosen sons and daughters of God occupy Israel permanently, that the Armageddon will happen. The rapture will happen. Jesus Christ will come back. The second coming will happen. And Jesus will fight the devil in Megiddo. It sounds insane like it's a goddamn anime when I repeat myself, but that is the real reason. And there are tens of millions of these people. 
that genuinely believe this. It sounds so stupid. And you know what happens to the Jews in that process when the rapture happens? They also burn in hell unless they convert to evangelical Christianity, of course. So it's not like it's not like these guys are, uh, you know, fond of Jewish people at all. Deaths of an untold number of innocent people, trade agreements would be destroyed, and global geopolitical dynamics would be unrecognizable. If you're a U.S. citizen, you may well ask, <clears throat> what could we get instead of a costly, unnecessary war with Iran? Well, we're glad you asked. According to a study by the Political Economy Research Institute, Medicare for All would cost approximately $37.8 trillion between 2017 and 2026. That would be approximately $3.78 trillion per year. While that is a lot, you could get three invasions of Iran for that, consider this. In 2021, U.S. citizens spent $4.3 trillion, or $12,914 per capita, on healthcare which doesn't cover everyone and severely underinsures most of the rest. In fact, you could add free college, which would only cost a comparatively tiny $680 billion per year, and still spend less money than Americans spent on healthcare in 2021. That is obscene. The bottom line is, the United States has better things to spend its vast, unprecedented wealth on than more wars. If the US were to allow Israel to drag it into a conflict with Iran, it's probably safe to say, without hyperbole, it would be the end of the world as we understand it. Episodes like this one are made possible thanks to our generous patrons on Patreon. Wait, what? Regime, a government especially an authoritarian one, America's so authoritarian they're gonna jail us on any day now? I have no power. I am, as it stands, not a threat. By the way, this new line is so incredibly stupid. Wait, what? Eduardo, authoritarian governments jail average Joes. Okay, then America is an authoritarian government, dumbass. The fuck kind of argument is this? They jail average Joes on a daily basis. What are you talking about? That's all we do. It's pack watch if you're broke. Born in the wrong neighborhood, going to jail. Not for criticizing the government, though. Okay. First of all, American, the American government does lock you in jail in spite of the First Amendment. If you do actually threaten American State Department power, if you threaten America's State Department interests, if you threaten America's uh, uh, power, you will get arrested. Hello, look at Edward Snowden. Why the f*** does he have to live in Russia? Look at Julian Assange. Chelsea Manning, Hazard Abahead, was literally in prison. That's so dumb. <clears throat> America periodically in times of war has also jailed many conscientious objectors. You literally have people criticizing Joe for Palestine stuff on Twitter, getting visited by the feds on your sub. Yeah. There's also that too. There's like, we haven't gotten to the, you're going to get arrested. Like, like it's Nazi Germany era yet, but we're coming at it. It is pretty funny that, that you're like, Oh yeah. America's not authoritarian because by your metrics, they are. Oh.